In the tumultuous and politically charged landscape of the Middle East, a group known as Hamas emerged as a significant player in the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. To understand the complete history of Hamas, we must go back to its roots and follow its journey through decades of conflict, resistance, and political evolution. The birth of Hamas, 1987, in the late 1980s, the Palestinian territories, particularly the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, were under Israeli occupation. Frustration and anger among Palestinians had reached a boiling point. It was during this period, in December 1987, that Hamas was born, Hamas, an acronym for Harakat al muqawama al-Islamiya, or the Islamic Resistance Movement. Initially emerged as a grassroots movement, blending Islamic ideology with Palestinian nationalism. Its founders included Sheikh Ahmed Yassin and Abdul Aziz al-Rantizi, both religious leaders. Hamas aimed to resist Israeli occupation and promote Islamic values within Palestinian society, the First Intifada, 1987-1993, the First Intifada, a Palestinian uprising against Israeli rule, provided fertile ground for Hamas to gain popularity. The group organized social services and charitable activities alongside its armed resistance efforts. These dual strategies garnered support among Palestinians who were frustrated with the existing leadership under the Palestinian Liberation Organization, PLO. Oslo Accords and Political Transformation, 1993-2000, the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993 between the PLO and Israel marked a turning point. Hamas opposed the Accords, viewing them as a betrayal of Palestinian rights. The group continued its attacks on Israeli targets, leading to a series of suicide bombings and clashes during the 1990s. In a display of audacity, militants even carried out an amphibious operation on the Mediterranean Sea. Paragliders dotted the sky as they descended upon two dozen locations in Israel. It was a well-coordinated assault that had blindsided the Israeli intelligence community, adding to the astonishment was the relentless barrage of rockets unleashed by Hamas. Israel's vaunted intelligence agencies, known for their surveillance prowess, were caught off guard. Israel was believed to have eyes and ears everywhere in Gaza, with an extensive network of informants. Yet, they had not seen this coming, we were surprised this morning. About failures, I prefer not to talk at this point right now. We're in war. We're fighting, Lt. Col. Richard Hecht, a spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces, admitted during an interview on CNN. As the dust settled and the echoes of explosions grew fainter, Israel found itself in a desperate struggle to regain full control of its territory. The Hamas attack had not only inflicted physical damage but had shaken the very foundations of Israeli security and intelligence. It was a chapter in their history that would be forever etched in their memory, a day when the unexpected became reality, and the nation was left grappling with the aftermath of a colossal failure. Amidst the tumultuous backdrop of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Israeli intelligence apparatus found itself distracted and stretched thin, its focus drifting away from the brewing storm that was about to hit home. In the preceding months, the Israel Defense Forces had been deeply engrossed in the West Bank. There, young Palestinian men had taken it upon themselves to resist the Israeli occupation, launching their own determined initiatives. The West Bank was consuming their attention, remarked Hoffman a seasoned scholar of Israeli-Palestinian relations spanning four decades, tensions had also flared around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a site of profound significance for both Muslims and Jews. Israeli police raids on worshippers had provoked outrage and unrest. There were a lot of assets and resources focused on monitoring events in Jerusalem, noted Hoffman. Meanwhile, within Israel's borders, the nation stood divided, grappling with mounting domestic political strife. A contentious decision by Israel's parliament in July had curtailed the power of judges to challenge government decisions, sparking public fury and large-scale protests. Amidst this turmoil, some reservists from Israel's military had even refused to report for duty, although they ultimately answered the call when the crisis hit. It was against this backdrop of polarization and distraction that Hamas seized its moment. They strike precisely when they sense an opportunity, observed Hoffman. When they see a gap generally in their enemy's defenses, generally caused by distraction or preoccupation with other threats or challenges, the assault unfolded during the Jewish Sabbath and the early hours of the Simchat Torah holiday. Israeli soldiers, entrusted with guarding the border, 
lamented on social media that militants had overrun their base, claiming the lives of soldiers. The number of troops on duty had been diminished due to the holiday observance. In stark contrast to the past decade, during which Hamas had predominantly relied on rocket attacks, Israeli forces stationed around Gaza had grown complacent, unprepared for a ground assault. Hoffman reflected, they weren't at all battle ready. The eerie quietude along the border with Gaza should have raised suspicions, but the sheer audacity and complexity of the attack caught them off guard. Hoffman, who acknowledged Israel's intelligence capabilities as second only to the United States, marveled at Hamas tactics. The combination of air, land, and sea assaults was unprecedented in recent terrorist history. Both Israel and the U.S. had designated Hamas, the governing authority of the Gaza Strip. As a terrorist organization, I can't recall any time where a group was able to put them together and stage a simultaneous coordinated assault using all three venues, Hoffman mused. The events that unfolded were beyond imagination a stark reminder of the ever-evolving nature of conflict and the relentless adaptability of those who wage it.